Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit uh, for you for a little while. What would you like to talk about tonight on this uh, anonymous telephone program wherein we are so intensely interested in the Bible? Our only desire is to encourage all of us to get into the Bible more and more and to develop a greater and greater interest in it and also a knowledge of many things that it's teaching, but of all, above all, that we might have a real desire to be obedient to it. We have a very interesting letter tonight. It's from South Africa. It's from a young lady, a listener, who's 22 years of age, and and uh, it speaks for a whole lot of people today. Uh, she said, she writes here, My ex-boyfriend and I were sexually uh, active before a friend told me about your radio station. So I got pregnant during our relationship. He decided that I must go for an abortion. At first, I was hurt because I thought he loved me and it would be nice to have his baby, but he thought it was best for both of us to get the abortion, and so I did. From that day, I started drinking, and, and I did stop drinking for a while, but again, I started drinking not as much as before, but I'm afraid I may get addicted. I, it felt I felt like I had committed a very serious sins and I can't talk to sin and I can't talk to anyone about it. As for this moment, I have been without sex for 10 months and very afraid to have a boyfriend. A friend's mom and I were talking about abortion today and she told me that there is no forgiveness for abortion and I was in shock and then decided to write you. My question to you is, is there not forgiveness for abortion? And am I going to hell to do? Uh, do you think that God would forgive me for my sin if I would believe that he would? I'm so, so heartbroken for uh, my many sins. I really don't want to go to hell. I hope you can answer my question. Well, you know, this is typical of what sin does to us. Sin is destructive and uh, because sin is rebellion against God. Now, why does a person feel so bad about sin? And Because deep in their heart, they know there is a God that they have to answer to. Like this young lady intuitively knows this. But the good news is... And it is wonderful news. Christ came for sinners. He didn't come for good, self-righteous people who can, uh, who can believe in their heart, Oh, I'm just a fine person. I never commit sin. I'm just, just living a very, uh, very moral, decent life. And, and uh, so I... I uh, don't really have any problem with sin. Well, that person is kidding themselves, is deceiving themselves, because even the slightest sin is a serious sin in God's eyes and must be paid for. But uh, when we have committed terrible sin, sin that we're thoroughly ashamed of, sin that we just uh, feel, uh, how could God forgive me for what did I do? I murdered that baby, had that baby murdered that was in my womb. And how can God ever forgive me? Well, the good news is, and this is that Christ came for sinners. He came for sinners. And no matter how much sin we've committed, how how uh, many people we've killed or, or how much adultery we've engaged in or how much sexual perversion or how many drugs we've been on or, or how long we've been an alcoholic or whatever, whatever, whatever. How much we've hated, how much whatever. Christ came for sinners. And, but of course, we cannot set the 
we cannot set up the program so that we will become saved. God has to save us. It's totally his work to save us. But what we can do is get into the Bible. And as we get into the Bible, we can pray, Oh, Lord, help me to be obedient to what I find here. Help me to begin to trust in Jesus as my Savior, even though I know that it's all, it's all together up to God to save me if he so wishes to do that. And maybe, 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 as I plead with God and beg God for his mercy and God commands us to do that, it's actually a command that we are to pray God for his mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And, and uh, there is a high, uh, there's a high, possibility that I too might be saved, particularly in this day when sin is so rampant. This whole story of of sexual misconduct and abortion that follows is is going on all over the world today. It's as common as grass. And and that's just one sin amongst many, many terrible uh, sins of of uh, that are completely rebellion in rebellion against God and are messing up people's lives. But it's also at this time that there is a great multitude. The Bible tells us that. And God is faithful to every commitment he makes. When he says there is a great multitude which no man can number that are going to become saved, it means that that is happening today. Uh, there's no question at all. God is absolutely true to his commitments and completely able to keep his commitments. So, my dear friend, you know, if you've gone through this misery of sin, take heart, cry to God for mercy, turn from your sin as best you can, and, and, and tr uh, pray, God, that you might be obedient to his word, and, and pray, oh, Lord, is it possible, could it be, uh, that I too might be thy child. But you have to bear in mind, we have to wait upon God. We cannot go to God insisting, and oh Lord, I'm so troubled, I'm so frightened. Uh, please, please save me next week, no, no later than next week, or maybe no later than next month. No, we, we never set a timeline. We wait upon the Lord. We just wait upon him, and in the meanwhile, we try to become more and more familiar with the Word of God. That is why on this program, we try to encourage people to get into the Bible, because that is where God speaks. That is where you learn about sin. That is where you learn about the fact that God has a salvation plan, as well as the fact that he is coming in judgment and already is in preparing the world for judgment for those who uh, do not uh, he uh, who for those whom he will not save and and uh, the world has got a lot of people like that also but that's God's business we leave that all together with God but thank you for that letter and I uh, and may you have the assurance of knowing you can cry out to God for his mercy. And God is a merciful God. God is a merciful God. That the Bible insists over and over and over again. But shall we now go to our first caller on our telephone lines? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campering. I have one question. I believe in the book of Mark, when the um, soldiers came to arrest Jesus, they, I think I read that um, there was a young man there who had a linen cloth wrapped around his waist. Yes. And um, he had to run away naked. Could you please explain to me what's going on there? Yes. And I'll take my answer off the air because I'm on the cell phone. Thank you. Yes. The, uh, the, uh, it's a very curious statement. It, uh, it, the timing was right after Christ left the upper room. Now, 
uh, he was with his disciples in the upper room celebrating the Passover that began that Thursday evening at sundown and would continue. The Passover would be in full force. Uh, the next day was Christ is hanging on the cross when he would actually be the Passover lamb. Uh, and, and, uh, but, uh, uh, in order for Christ to be the Passover lamb, it meant that he had to be punished for all of my dirty, rotten sins. In other words, he had to be in a position where he is like the chief of sinners, like he is the worst one of all, because he was laden with enormous amount of sin, the sin of each and every human being who had ever lived throughout the history of the world and for whom Christ had planned salvation. And so he, uh, he had to stand before the judgment throne of God as a guilty, guilty, guilty sinner, be found guilty and be sentenced to uh, to uh, eternal damnation. Uh, he had to, uh, so that he could endure or make pay the penalty demanded by the law of God for sinners. Therefore, uh, God uh, uh, set up a series of events to show that here is Christ, who really is eternal God. He never ceased to be God. And who is the head of all of the kingdom of God, who is the, uh, in charge of the whole kingdom of God, and yet he had to abandon all of this and to endure hell. And so that's why in the upper room he already countermanded what he had earlier uh, told the apostles, uh, that they were to trust only in in God, and now they were to trust in a sword, they were to trust in in a, in a money bag, and so on. And then uh, uh, I, uh, uh, here was this young man who was who was representing was representing the whole body of believers. He was robed with a with a garment of some kind, and they took that garment away from him, so he fled away naked. It's like there is at this moment, it looks like there is no robe of Christ's righteousness. We have to understand that spiritually. That was a historical parable. Uh, this young man represented a church that at this point did not have a head. Uh, there were, it looked like there was no uh, no possibility of, of anything c good coming because Christ had to endure hell. That's why the three apostles that were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane a little bit later in that same evening, they should have been, they should have been uh, uh, wide awake, troubled to this core of their being because their beloved master was so troubled. He was a stone throws distance away and he was throwing himself to the ground with loud cries and the sweat was pouring off his body like great drops of blood into the ground and 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 yet they were sound asleep. Those three apostles represented a church that, were, that appeared dead at the moment. And, and a little bit later, that same night, uh, here is his beloved apostle Peter, loves him dearly. And when someone comes along and asks him, uh, are you too one of uh, a Galilean, a follower of this Jesus who's on trial? And he denied it with a curse. Not once, not twice, but three times he denied it. It was a terrible betrayal of Jesus, his beloved master. But Peter was acting out without realizing it, what uh, the fact that Christ had to abandon uh, his believers momentarily in order that he might endure hell for our sins. And all of these incidents and a couple of others also were, were, uh, were emphasizing the fact that Christ all alone had to endure hell for our sins. How that all, how he endured hell, we don't know. We do know when he hung on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
uh, somehow it was an enormous, enormous punishment he was enduring because God was forsaking God. Uh, we can't even imagine how, how all of that could be. But in the space of the time of uh, all the way from the upper room until he said it is finished on the cross, uh, 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 during those hours, it had to, he had to suffer the equivalent of, of all of those he had come to save, spending an eternity in hell. So God had to punish him with virtually an infinite punishment. And because he never ceased to be infinite God, he could absorb that punishment and come out at the other end of eternity, which is impossible unless you're an infinite God, could come out at the other end and and say it is finished. The penalty had been completely paid. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, C Call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, uh, Brother Camping. Yes. Could you turn to Leviticus 25.11, please? Leviticus 25.11. Let's look at that. Mm -hmm. I just have one little question. Le Le Leviticus 25.11. Mm -hmm. There we read... A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. Uh, and, and the year of this jubilee shall return every man unto his possession, and okay, so on. Okay, don't, don't read anymore. Now, what is your question? <laughs> My question is in the use here. It says, a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. Isn't that singular? And then it says, ye shall not so. Everybody doesn't have the same jubilee year. We only have about two for each person. If we have two. Oh, no. Uh, this, the fact is that uh, God here is Look giving... Excuse now. me. Excuse me. God is giving the rules for the nation of Israel to follow, which actually are... Remember, Christ spoke in parables, and Christ is the Word of God. Uh, that is, he spoke with earthly language to illustrate spiritual truth and the jubilee the function of the jubilee was to uh, uh, we read in verse 9 thou shalt cause the the shofar the ram, ram's horn not the trumpet that that's not a good translation the ram's horn of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall ye make the shofar the ram's horn sound throughout all your land and ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim now here is the proclamation and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof it shall be a jubilee unto you and ye shall return every man unto his possession and ye shall return every man unto his family you see it is the, it, when we when we understand this, it is simply a, a, a day or a year, rather, during which God is emphasizing the gospel is to go out into all the world, uh, to be uh, to be delivered or to receive, uh, 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 to be uh, uh, to have liberty is to be uh, to, is to receive liberty from our sins and from the wrath of God that we so rightly deserve for our sins. In other words, it is focusing on the great and wonderful fact that the gospel was going to go out into the world, and actually, God. God, as we look at these 50-year interval, intervals uh, that continued, they began with that first 50-year point right after they came into the land of Canaan. 
we find that the year that Christ was born was, uh, from all the evidence of the Bible, was uh, in a high likelihood the year 7 B.C., which was a jubilee year. And he, of course, came to, as the very essence of the jubilee. He came to be the Savior that was to be proclaimed into all the world. Kevin, wasn't that Jesus Christ's jubilee year? He was born in a jubilee year, 50 years after that, which was 1994. That's exactly right. That's then he was then, then that was a jubilee year for him. But if a person was born in 1934, their jubilee year would be 1984, right? No, the the this uh, in excuse the Bible me, here. excuse me. Uh, there have been jubilee years every 50 years, but uh, even as it was in the days of the Old Testament, uh, if we if we start at uh, at uh, uh, 1357 B.C., that was the first year they would have celebrated the Jubilee. And then as we go, the next uh, year would have been 1307. Yet there was nothing noteworthy that happened in the year 1307. Then the next one was 1257 B.C. Nothing noteworthy happened. Then the next year was uh, 1207 B.C. Nothing noteworthy happened until we get to... 7 B.C., something wonderful happened, namely Christ was born, and he had everything to do with the Jubilee. Then we keep going through it from that point uh, to uh, uh, the, the next Jubilee year would have been four, a, 44 A.D., nothing noteworthy happened. The next one was 94 A.D., nothing noteworthy happened until we get to the year 1994 A.D., and as we apply our, our compare Scripture with Scripture and, and, uh, and harmonize a lot of passages of Scripture, we find, lo and behold, 1994, that was exactly for, uh, 40 Jubilee periods after seven, the 7 B.C. Jubilee, uh, there, a great and wonderful thing happened that again the Holy Spirit was poured out and God began a great program, a final program of evangelizing the world as uh, uh, during the period during which uh, Revelation 7 verse 9 is talking about a great multitude which no man can number. So we have to find, and this was true of all of the ceremonial feast days, whether it was the Passover or the first day of the seventh month, which was really the day of Jubilee, uh, or whether it was the uh, uh, the Feast of Pentecost. Every every uh, uh, one of these days had there were times when they were particularly outstanding. But we have to find these times only by very carefully uh, searching the scriptures and knitting together the various passages of the Bible so that they harmonize together uh, like fitting pieces into a jigsaw puzzle. We have to find the exact place where this piece goes. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Camping? Yes. Uh, last week on Monday, there was a woman that called in, and she made a statement, and then she asked a question also, but you didn't hear her. She said she'd take her answer over the air. Now, the statement she made was that uh, more often than not, the Bible ascribes evil to women. And she didn't give any specific uh, scriptures, but the ones I thought of were the uh, original act of creation with temptation of Eve, uh, the snake, and then the other one was uh, Apostle Paul uh, making a pronouncement that uh, women should have no authority in spiritual matters over men. You know, uh, women should keep silent in the church. And then the question she asked was that, uh, uh, was there any place in the Bible you could find that uh, doesn't uh, uh, ascribe evil to women or that, you know, makes a good statement about them? And the one I found was Galatians 3.28. If you'd like to read that. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There we find 
There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Yes, you see, spiritually, we all stand on the same ground. Uh, uh, and uh, but, but insofar as our task or our function, that can be different. And I use this illustration all the time that God assigned the task of bearing children to the women. Now, no man can take over that task. He might want to. He might uh, seriously wish that he could bear a child, but he can't. God has not assigned that to man. Uh, and just like he's assigned certain tasks to men that, uh, that he does not expect women to get involved in, but that does not ch change for a moment the fact that a woman stands spiritually on the same ground, on the same level with a man. A man has no advantage at all spiritually over a woman, nor a woman over a man. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello, Camping. Yes. Um, I, I had a question. That, um, see, now, I remember that um, there was some... Uh, okay. Well, the no, first question is, I remember when they talk about there were some people that were pre, um, s s teaching me about the Bible and um, in my college, and they talk about how when when a man has sex with a woman, or then that means spiritually they have like their spirit and like you know like each time um, they have sex with like wh whoever they have sex with, then basically they have become one person or something like. The spirits join. Is that true? Well, the the fact is that that the sexual union is a very holy union that is to be observed observed only in the marriage relationship. The two become one, and and uh, when that. That that uh, kind of emphasis or that kind of action is performed outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. It is completely in rebellion against the way God had set it up, and there is nothing good about it. There's nothing good about it. It just uh, at the moment it may seem to be very joyful or happy to the individuals involved, but for the long haul. Oh, no, 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 no. It is a terrible thing. It's um, I have, I have uh, actually another question, though, and it's about... Um... Yeah, huh, hold on. I'll have to, t I'll have to pause for this message. We have a caller on the line with a question. Go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, um, Harold. Um, I was actually gonna ask about Satan. Like, does he move very quick? Like, do you? Because this world is awfully large for him to you, be uh, in you know, two places you, at once. Are you asking the question of what does Satan know? Yeah. Like, well, well, the fact is. Uh, Satan uh, can, knows quite a bit. He knows something about the future. He knows there's a judgment day coming, definitely. Uh, he uh, he uh, uh, knows who Christ is because he was in heaven for 11,000 years. And he had access into heaven, so he knows who God is. Uh, and uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, he, he is... Uh, able to come as an angel of light uh, uh, be, uh, so that he knows a lot of the truths of, of the facts of the Bible. But but uh, he cannot know, if we become a child of God, if we are taken, if we are in the, in the kingdom of Christ, then he cannot have anything on us. We do not belong to him at all. He uh, he, we're in a different kingdom altogether. We've been translated from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. And, and so anyone who is a true believer does not have to fear Satan at all. We know he's a conquered, 
uh, foe. Uh, we know that his doom is certain, that when Christ returns on the last day, he will immediately be cast into hell, uh, and so on. But, you know, I, I, as we study the Bible, we don't want to focus on Satan. It's bad enough that we have to say from time to time that he rules in the churches, and that's an enormously terrible, terrible fact that the Bible discloses to us, and it's a warning as to why one of the big reasons why people in the churches really ought to get out, because without realizing it, they are worshiping Satan rather than Christ. Uh, and he can get away with it, uh, uh, f- and so far as these people are concerned, because he comes as an angel of light, and the ministers... Uh, are called his ministers are called ministers of righteousness that is they look like they have the gospel of the bible when actually they are bringing their own kind of a gospel but but the fact is that he is a completely defeated foe when we become a child of god and we enter the kingdom of god we reign with Christ, and, and wow. Satan is nobody that we have to worry about. Okay, that was good, though, because I am a child of God. I never feel good when I do something that God doesn't want me to do. Well, then, so I, don't, huh? don't worry about Satan. What you want to uh, be thinking about, oh, Lord, help me to do your will more and more. Oh, Lord, work in me to Thank willing you. to do of your good pleasure. That is the intense desire of the child of God. Thank you. Thank you, Harold Camping. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. I have a question. In one of the Gospels, I think it's Matthew, uh, they give some numbers about the uh, generations between... Uh, Abraham to the captivity, and then that's 14 generations, and then another 14 yes. to King David, and 14 to Jesus. Is, is there significance to that? I'll take the answer off the air, thank you. Yeah, that's a very curious thing. It's, uh, uh, I, I've, I've read that off uh, very frequently and puzzled about it, and I don't know the full reason uh, for this. I do understand, however, that God is giving us a little bit of information about the latitude that we have when we are looking at the numbers of the Bible. For example, frequently when we look for the timing from one event to another and we see that sometimes we can see significant numbers come out when it's just exactly the uh, there were exactly 1,290 years between the two events. But on the other hand, sometimes we find two events that are almost exactly uh, 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 apart by a significant number, except that they are to be understood as uh, uh, inclusive. That is, the first year and the last year are, are to be included in order to get a significant number. Uh, like going, for example, going from the number 1 to number 10, we can say that that is 9 years. You subtract 1 from 10, there's 9 years to go from the number 1 to uh, from the first year to the 10th year. Or you can say, inclusive, it's 10 years. If we count that if year 1 is one of the of the years and the year 10 as the years. And this is exactly what... Uh, God does in Matthew chapter 2, surprisingly, where uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 1, rather, no, Matthew chapter, hmm, we've got the genealogy in chapter 1. The ge- it's actually the genealogy of Joseph. But when he goes 14 years uh, from uh, from Abraham to Solomon, that's those are... Uh, just uh, exactly for, uh, f- uh, 14 year, uh, 14 generations rather, and then he, when he goes from Solomon uh, to, uh, 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 excuse me, from Abraham to David rather, from Abraham to David, 14 generations. Then he goes from David to 
a king that uh, at the time of the Babylonian captivity, again, it's 14 generations. But then when he goes from there to Joseph, who was the father of Jesus, we find that actually there were 13 generations, although there were 14 generations inclusive, if we count the first, the the year of the, Bab- the uh, of the Babylonian captivity, uh, as well as the year that Joseph was born, and so God, by this means, is giving us instruction that as we look at time plans in the Bible, and the Bible has a lot of time plans that are that develop as we as we work through the, all the number numbers of the Bible. Uh, that we are in, we are allowed to think in terms of the passage of time, or we, and we can use the uh, like the illustration that I use from one to ten. We can come up with nine years or ten years inclusive, and both have spiritual validity. But uh, that's at least one purpose of this. The other purpose, there's another big purpose in all of this, although this has nothing to do with the numbers. It has to do with the fact that uh, as we go through this and see the names that are given here, it's absolutely guarantees that it could not have been the genealogy of Jesus, because all the names of the kings of Judah are named, and and uh, from the t- that line was cursed, and Christ came as the king, so he could not have come through that line that we find in Matthew chapter 1. That's, that's, a, that's a different purpose altogether that God gave this. Now, there may be other reasons, and, but uh, that's, that's, as, uh, that's the best that I've been able to do with this particular uh, account. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I was on the phone with you about last week. Uh, uh, excuse, the... excuse me, would you turn your radio off, please? I guess due to the fact yeah. that I'm on a cell phone. All right. But I had a question for you. Yeah, now what is your question? The Roman Catholic Church, they have a um, old way of doctrine. I don't know how old it is, but they only remain innate to the Bible. And they don't open the Bible because they feel, I guess, oh, the Bible is cursed as God wrote it. And as the earth is cursed. How do you feel about that? Is that good guidance in, in preserving religions that always can be preserved and never destroyed? Well, no. The fact is that the Roman Catholic Church, like uh, all the denominations to uh, a lesser or greater degree, some uh, some denominations are more guilty than others, but to some degree, uh, churches have started with the Bible. Oh, yes, they want to talk about Christ because Christ is presented on the pages of the Bible. Uh, and... And yet they really want their own kind of a religion. And so they have used what they like of the Bible and then added to that or or modified that to develop their own kind of a religion. And that's true of every denomination. The only true religion has to be one in which the Bible alone and in its entirety is the sole authority, the ultimate authority. But you see, uh, the moment that you close the Bible and and figure out a, a rationale why we don't open the Bible, what they've really uh, admitted or or intended is that the Bible is not their authority. They can say uh, nice words about why they do it, but the fact is, no, they don't want the Bible as their authority. They want the church to be the authority. So that, of course, is terrible. And that's exactly why today... God uh, wants everyone out of the churches so that we don't have that stumbling block in the way. And we start afresh. We We don't come to the Bible with any of our church doctrines, whatever denomination we belong to, whether it's 
Baptist or Methodist or Roman Catholic or Seventh-day Adventist or Jehovah Witness or Mormon or whatever it is, and we go only to the Bible, and we go to the Bible uh, with the attitude, oh, Lord, I don't know anything. You teach me, and, and, and whatever I finally learn, oh, Lord, can it be that it will be altogether faithful to the Bible, the whole Bible, not just to some verses of the Bible, but that what uh, conclusions I have come to begin to believe in, that they may be in harmony with each and everything, every part of the Bible that might relate to what I am, whatever doctrine I'm speaking of. But thank Third you. religions, and can all religions be preserved well enough? I'm not to be destroyed? Well, the, yes, God, you see, indicates that in our day, God has finished utilizing the churches. Now, this was a big deal. Because so whatever are we actually in, and what course of religions do we follow or intend to when what, but, you're actually, you had a book, I, I got it, Time Has an End, but, uh, you know, I'm believing in the Bible as it's versed, is it restoring religions? And is it restoring the churches one day in the day and era that we are in to uh, better preserve life, you know, and yeah, humanity, but, mainly moral peace that we all often all pray for? Well, but you see, uh, we can we can uh, look at this very objectively. The Bible, uh, we have the same Bible that was available uh, when it was finished in the year uh, um, about 95 A.D. approximately. In other words, about almost 2,000 years ago, the Bible was finished. And we have that Bible. We have the original uh, Hebrew language from which it came in and the original Greek language so that a, a, prop, a, a, a good Bible teacher will be checking out his translation, whatever it may be, against that original Hebrew and that original Greek, the uh, the very earliest that is available, and 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 follow the biblical rules that we are to compare spiritual things with spiritual, and it, and that's a must. If we don't follow the biblical rules, then we're not going to learn from the Bible. And at the one of the biblical rules is that we pray for wisdom. It is God the Holy Spirit who has to open our eyes. The Bible is a living word. It's not just an, an ordinary book at all. It's the living word of God. It is right. It is Every time we read the Bible, it's like we are hearing God speak to us because these words came right from the mouth of God. And that hasn't been understood in the churches at all. Uh, it hasn't been understood that the whole Bible is the law of God. And therefore, it is absolutely authoritative over the life of every human being. That has not been understood in the local congregations either or the denominations. But it's not the church that has the authority. It is the Bible that is the authority. And, and, and that's why now God is not interested in churches. He wants people to listen to the Bible. It's God and each individual, not God and the church. And then coming down to the individual, it's God and the individual because God can apply that word uh, directly to that individual's life and make him his child. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, sh shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Um, good evening, Brother Campin. I have a question. Um, if you have a husband who hates you and justifies it with the um, with um, Jesus saying that um, you sh a husband should have his wife and children and that all submission, and also um, not only hate you but call you a fool and um, stupid and idiot, what should you do as a child of God? No, I didn't quite understand your... Uh, could you say, ask me the question again and speak a little more slowly, please? Okay. If you have a husband 
who hear you, who beat you up. And if, just if, five, if, if, excuse me, if we have what? I didn't get that. A one. husband. Oh, a husband. You're talking about your husband. Okay. Yes. I'm with you now. And he beats you, and he, he, when you ask him whether what he's doing is um, a godly thing to do, he tells you, um, Jesus said you should have your wife and children under all submission. That's his justification. And if he calls you a fool, an idiot, and a stupid woman, he tells you, Jesus called people fools in the Bible all the time. What should you do? Well, you know, I, I, the husband-wife relationship is very, very difficult because you have two people each having their own will, and and the Bible instructs us that uh, that the woman is to be submissive to her husband, and and but the husband is also instructed that he is to love his wife and want the very best for her. He is to deny himself in order to do the best for her. And if we had uh, an ideal marriage where both the husband and the wife were trying to do it God's way, you can have a very beautiful marriage. But supposing I am married to a husband who doesn't follow the biblical rules, supposing he asks me to do things that are contrary to the Bible, then what? And that is where it takes a great amount of patience and forgiveness and uh, and also uh, uh, the fact that we may have to suffer because of it. Now, the biblical rule always is that we tr we you try to be obedient to your husband in all things lawful. If he asks you to do something contrary to the law of God, then you very gently, not 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 arrogantly at all. Uh, uh, saying, oh, no, 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 I'm a child of God. I don't want to obey you on that. No, you come very, very sweetly to your husband and say, honey, I love you dearly. I want to obey you. I try in, in all the various things uh, uh, that we do together. But on this matter, I, I, I have to obey Christ, and I can't do what you're asking me because it would be contrary to the law of God. Now, if you've... If you want to beat me or if you want to uh, 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 hate me, that's your problem. I'm sorry for that, but I, I love you. I love you. And, and so uh, in everything else, you try extra hard to show that you are trying to be a dutiful, obedient uh, wife to your husband. And the same is true for the husband. Uh, he is to, uh, there are times when his wife will not obey God uh, and and will want something that is contrary to the law of God. And again, he very sweetly and, and patiently and forgivingly has to be very patient with his wife and say, I love you, and, and, uh, and uh, I, I'm always going to want the very best for you, but I, I can't go along with your idea because that would be contrary to the law of God. And you try to work it out, and there are, will be times when all you can do is go to the Lord, and that's everything as a matter of fact, because He is the one who knows all about it. He knows about your marital situation. Absolutely He does. And you can go, oh Lord, have mercy. Oh Lord, have mercy. Give me more patience. Give me more uh, love for my husband. Give me more uh, sweetness in my life. And But oh Lord, uh, uh, Please help me to be obedient only to thy word and, and have mercy on my husband. And, and the same is true, the husband praying for the wife. And, and there are times when you, you, uh, you don't know what to do, but, all, but you, the one thing you can do is lay it all out before the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm so glad that you will never leave me nor forsake me. And will you strengthen me and give me wisdom through this very difficult situation we're going through. But, oh, Lord, can it be that somehow I'll go through this being obedient to thee, which includes continuing in my love for my spouse that I 
will never turn around and despise him be, or her because of the wickedness that my, I might see there. Um, but can you explain to me what um, the Bible saying a husband must have um, put his wife and children in the whole submission? Does well, that mean a husband can hit his wife? Well, but you see, the, the best passage that we have, uh, uh, there are others too, but Ephesians chapter 5. Now, this is God speaking. He says in verse 22, Ephesians 5, this came right from the mouth of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, that is of all of those who are true believers, that's the eternal church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church, this eternal church, is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Then he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, you see, what did Christ do? Did he love us who became believers, who are the eternal church, because we were so good, so fine, so loving? Absolutely not. We were dirty, despicable, and yet he loved us uh, and he, and he, to, to, uh, by giving his life by, at an enormous cost in order that we might be his bride. And so that gives us a clue, uh, uh, husbands a clue, as to how we have to empty ourselves of our own desires in order that we might do the very best for our wives. And this is, this is the, the passage that you, both you and your husband might read again and again and again and pray the Lord for wisdom. That's Ephesians chapter 5. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Of our own Hello. Yes. Uh, Isaiah 45, starting verse 6. Isaiah uh, 45, verse 6. Let's look through at that. 8. Uh, that they may... Uh, here, let's start with verse 5. I am Jehovah, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am Jehovah. And there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Jehovah, do all of these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, Jehovah, have created it. Now, what is your question? Uh, well, it says that he creates evil, uh, like is it in the time we're having now uh, in the churches, and he's pouring down righteousness. Is that the salvation program that's going on now uh, outside the churches? And then, all right, uh, that's uh, now. First of all, the evil that he creates is not the evil of sin. God is not the author of sin, but. There is lots of evil that God did create because of man's sin. Uh, the fact that this world is cursed, that's an evil thing, that there are thorns and thistles and poisonous bacteria and viruses and poisonous snakes and, and jellyfish and so on. That is evil for this the population of the world, and God has made it so. There is the evil of judgment day remember in the lord's prayer which is really a prayer for salvation uh, deliver me not in, unto evil uh, or, or uh, deliver me from uh, oh boy now i uh, deliver me from evil uh, uh, let's see uh, our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven 
give us this day our daily bread and and uh, forgive us our s- s- trespasses as we have trespa- forgiven those who have trespassed against us and deliver us from evil and bring us not into temptation that is into trial it's the evil of judgment day that we're praying for that we might be delivered from judgment day but uh, but god has 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 provided he has created judgment day because the law of god demands that that mankind have to stand for uh, the tr- for trial before god to determine whether they are right or wrong now verse 8 however is a wonderful wonderful statement uh, here god has made a big pitch here i am god beside me there is none I I do all of these things he's been talking about. And now he is giving us the, the wonderful thing that he has done. He says, drop down, ye heavens. This is God speaking, and it will happen from above. And let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, Jehovah, have created it. In other words, God has created his whole salvation plan so that there's a great multitude which no man can number in our day being saved, as well as a number of people who were saved throughout the church age and so forth. But now we have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Captain. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I wanted to know John 3.16 and 17. Uh, You wanted to know about what? John 3.16, John 3.15 to 17? 3.16 3.16 and 17. 3, John 3.16 3, and 17. 17, yes, sir. Yes, now, let's read that. There we read, uh, f- uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, and so on. Now, what is your question? I wanted to know, I wanted to know that by those verses, what what does it mean to for God to send His, send his Son to, uh, to uh, pay for the uh, sins of man? Uh, you want to know why uh, it says here that God sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save the world? Uh-huh. Well, you see, the fact is that Christ is going to come again. In fact, he's already here bringing judgment. And, and, uh, and, but on, when he visibly returns, there's going to be a trial when all the unsaved of the world are going to stand for trial and be found guilty and condemned and sent to hell. And that makes a a large part of the world's population. But when Christ came 2,000 years ago, he came as the Savior. It was not his purpose at that time to come as the judge of all the earth. It was his purpose. The reason he came was so that he might uh, uh, in, uh, be laden with the, all the sins of those that he came to save 
and that he would be found guilty and God would pour out his wrath on him uh, as he is making payment for those sins. And that is what he's insisting here. I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save. Now, when he talks about the world, he's talking about those in the world whom he planned to save. Yeah. Uh, he, if, if he had talked about every human being in the whole world to save every human being, then there would be no condemnation for anybody. Then there would be nobody that could be sent to hell. Yet, right from the context of these verses themselves, as well as from a lot of other information in the Bible, we know there will be a great many people in hell throughout eternity future. And so that means that Christ had not come to save them. So that means uh, that Christ took the sins of the world upon himself, and when he, when he died on the cross, the, the uh, bondage of sin has been broken. Am I correct? No. Well, you, you see, when you say the sins of the world, if, he, if every sin that was ever committed in the world had been laid on him, and he had made the payment for them, then the law of God could never, never send any individual or, uh, to stand for trial and be found guilty and cast into hell. That would be an absolutely illegal impossibility because God is absolutely just in what he does. Now, the yeah. very fact that we read in Revelation 20, for example, where the where the are those standing before the judgment throne of God and the books are open uh, showing what sins they've committed and they're found guilty and they're cast into the lake of fire. It indicates their sins had never been paid for. So when we look at this word, word world here, we, 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 uh, we, have to, uh, we have to look at it in the light of what God will include in that word world. You know, it's interesting that in Luke chapter 2, God gives us a, 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 an example of how to understand the, the word world in the, in the Bible. In Luke chapter 2, we read where it says in, in uh, verse 1, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And this is, this is the way God wrote the Bible. And, uh, from time to time, when, uh, when you're, he's helping us to understand a difficult passage, somewhere else in the Bible, he will give us an illustration of a similar number, kind of words so we can understand how we can understand those words in the difficult passage. Now, the difficult passage we're looking at is John 3, where God is talking about uh, paying for the sins of the world. We read in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world, same word world, all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee and so on. Now, we know from this context that this taxation has to do with all of those who were under the authority of the Roman government. And the Roman government at this time in history did not rule over the Chinese nation, which was a great nation already at that time. It did not rule over the North American Indians. It did not rule over the uh, people in uh, the Indians of South America. It did not rule over uh, 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 all kinds of people who were not under the Roman Empire. And yet God is using the language right here. It's, a, it's, it's the same word world that all the world should be taxed indicating that when you see the word world, uh, don't immediately think of the whole universe, the whole planet Earth, but all the world that are subject to whatever, that part of the world that is subject to whatever is being talked about. Now, when Christ came to pay for the sins of the world, 
Therefore, he, we know that he did not come to pay for the sins of those who end up in hell because God's, uh, that, uh, God's justice would never, never make that possible. So we know that when he talks about the world, he's saying that he came to pay for the, uh, the sins of all those in the world who had been elected by God to become saved and therefore God had obligated himself to save them and they are the ones in all the world that he had come to save. And now we have complete harmony uh, with all the other passages of the Bible. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, um, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, you believe I've, in a predestination that we were all predestined for salvation? Well, that, that, that's what the Bible teaches. That isn't something that I thought about. This is something that, uh, that, we, that the Bible insists. Uh, right. It, it says it very plainly. Right, I understand that. But the only thing that doesn't make sense to me is God gave us a free will. So if everything is predestined, then how does our free will fit into that? Well, the free will, we, 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 uh, we have, it's true, we do have a free will. But the problem is, uh, to become saved, first of all, uh, it means that all of our sins have to be paid for and the penalty demanded by God is to spend eternity in hell. So so if yeah, no, we have I, a free I will understand what you're saying. If I have a free will, how in the world am, is my free will going to pay for my sins? How how, uh, how 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 am I going to get across that? How am I going to get across that? I can't Yeah, but it doesn't I, make sense if you're if everything is predestined then you you don't even have a choice to to say whether to sin or do good works. I mean, it, it, everything's well, predestined. It, so well, it, it doesn't make any sense to us when we try to establish our own philosophy of what God ought to do. But uh, that's because we don't understand that the Bible is a law book, and God is under the law of the Bible. God has to be... Uh, uh, has to has to follow the law of the Bible, uh, uh, and the, so he can't violate that. Now the well, law. Excuse me. Excuse me. The law has nothing to do with common sense. The law has to do with what God has 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 written into the law. When we when our government makes a law. We may think, huh, that law doesn't make any sense at all. But if it's a law, we have to obey it. It has nothing to do with common sense. It has to do with what is the law. Now, the law of God is that if we sin, the penalty for sin is eternal damnation. That is the law of God. We can say that doesn't make any sense. That, that's, uh, well, that, we may not like it. But that is the law, and that's what God has to deal with. And so, in order for him to, uh, if he decided to choose certain ones to become saved, then God also took on the burden of somehow figuring out how to make that payment for their sins. Because the, he, God could not just set that the law aside and say, well, I've chosen this one, so I'm just going to save them. No way. That penalty has to be paid. And so God had uh, himself had to be the one to take on the, the uh, punishment in order to save that person. In other words, God himself in the person of the Lord Jesus had to take on a human nature so he would be legally qualified to be a stand-in or a substitute 
for that individual. And then God had to pour out his wrath on him, the equivalent of him spending an eternity in hell, and he had to come out at the other end of hell. And only because Christ, when he suffered for our sins, was God as well as man could he could he bear such an infinite punishment? And so those sins now have been paid for. Now, that has nothing to do with our free will or not. We can have all the free will in the world, but we can't, we, in our free will, we can't decide we're going to uh, uh, get, uh, come into God's holy heaven uh, because the law won't allow it. The law says, no, you first have to go to hell forevermore and make payment for your sins. And then when you, if you ever could get to the end of eternity, then, and have made the payment, yes, then you can come into heaven. And so that, of course, means that door is completely closed. We can have all the free will in the world, but we can't, we can't, there's no way by just willing to do this, that we can get that payment made. Uh, Christ has to do it. And so uh, the, the problem is that the churches have set up salvation programs that are not listening to the Bible, that don't take into account the legality of the whole Bible, that it is a a supreme law book. And they have decided, we can decide to get ourselves saved by doing this or doing that. Well, it's true, we can decide to do that, but that doesn't mean it will accomplish, that, that by doing that, it will accomplish the end that we hope for. They, because that sin has to be paid for. And, and we can, the only, the only thing we can do with our free will is say, all right, I, I want to set up my own salvation plan. I'll get saved. I decide by my free will, I will endure the penalty demanded by the law of God. Throw me into hell, O Lord. And so of my own free will, I'm going to make the payment. And, and, and so how long am I going to be in hell? Well, the law establishes that forevermore, forevermore. That's all you can do with free will is, 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 uh, is decide to, uh, I, I, I'm going to get saved by what I do. And that means the only path open to me is by first going to hell forevermore, which, of course, is absolutely impossible to get out of. And so this, I, the, the argument is not free will. The argument is that, that the problem is that there is no way to come into God's holy heaven until hell has been paid for. And that's 100% the action of God. We in no way by, our, uh, by uh, an act of our will can get that paid for except by going, trying to do it by going to hell. And that's the way most people in the world will end up. They, they will be cast into hell forevermore. And because forevermore is forevermore, they'll never, never, never come out of it. It's an enormously uh, impossible way to try to get into heaven. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um, Mr. Camping, um, there was a lady that called earlier, and she was trying to find out if it was legal for her husband, according to the Bible, because Jesus had called people fools, for her husband to call her a fool and for her husband to beat her. That's really what she wanted. She wanted to know. Well, the the, does the Bible say that that's okay. Yeah, for her well, husband to beat her. You know, these are very difficult situations, and and uh, it is true. We have a government that does give some some uh, help in this. There are many nations where a government gives no help, and uh, a husband beats a, or his wife to death, or however badly he wants to treat her. We do get some protection from the government, but she may never think about divorce. This is still her husband. It's still her husband. She might get some protection from the government so that he will not ruthlessly beat her, but uh, uh, but uh, 
She is still to love him. She is still to want the very best for him and try to show her love. And, you know, uh, there's, a, there's, an old, uh, there, uh, there, there's an old adage that's not biblical, but it, it, it focuses on biblical principles, namely that it takes two to quarrel. And, you know, one of the problems is that here are two people and they begin to bicker. And then the bickering gets more intense. And then she uh, uh, will m- uh, make a, 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 a very bad remark to her husband. And so now he feels justified in getting tougher with her. And so it, the, the, the war develops. It, and it is a war that's developing right in that home. And, and finally, uh, uh, he may even take physical action against his wife because he's normally stronger than his wife, although some wives can take physical action on their husbands if they happen to be stronger than their husband. But that's what warfare does. And the best that you can do as a child of God is that, remember, it takes two to quarrel. And so your husband lashes out at you. Let's say it's the husband that is spoiling for a fight. He really, he's really bitter about something that, that you, you said earlier or he thought you said or a misunderstanding or whatever. And you, uh, and, and, what did Jesus do when he was reviled? He reviled and not again. And so you just say, husband, I know you are very unhappy. I know you, uh, you want to beat on me. And, and I haven't been the best wife in the world at all, but I, I want to tell you, I really want to love you. I really want to do the best for you. And, and so I'm sorry that you're so unhappy. I'm sorry that you want to get after me. And, and, uh, uh, but I'll, uh, even if you beat me, I want to, I want to tell you I love you. And I want to try to do everything for you as long as it's in accordance with the Word of God. Now, I'll tell you, a husband, I don't care how cruel he is by nature, is going to have a hard time fighting with that. Uh, He's going to have a hard time continuing the beating. But what happens is, is that, like I say, both of us, the husband and the wife, begin to get their back up and begin to uh, get that uh, fighting position. And and then, of course, uh, the, the husband or the wife has a reason for striking the next blow because look what you said or look what you did. And, and uh, they now feel uh, justified, more justified than ever. And so the first place to turn is not to the police. The first place to turn is to the Lord for, for help that, oh Lord, help me to walk more humbly. Help me to be more loving. Help me not to take the bait when my husband yells at me and, and tells me how he hates my dinner or hates my looks or whatever and say, oh honey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I want to tell you, I still love you because you are my husband. Incidentally, the love between a husband and a wife is not, should never be based on the fact she is so pretty or she's such a fine cook or she is such a, uh, a wonderful bed partner or she, or, and the love for the wife, for the husband, he is so handsome or he is so strong or he is so this or that. That is not the basis of the love that exists between a man and a woman, even though that may be the beginning of the courtship and so on. The basis is that God tells the husband to love the wife. God tells the wife to love the husband. In other words, it's, it is a command of God that to, we are to love each other and we are to love them whether they treat us nice or don't treat us nice. And that can go a long, long ways in, in helping uh, people get over very, very bad situations. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Campin. 
Yeah. Uh, I would like to know what's going on on uh, Job chapter 2, I guess, is when uh, it's, the Bible says that the Son of, the God, of God uh, get into God, and in between them was the devil. Now, are you, ta- are you talking about John chapter 2? No, Job. Job. Joel chapter 2? Yeah. All I right. guess it is there what it is. Let, let's look at Joel. And what, what verse are you looking not at? Joel. Job. Job. Joel. Not Joel. Job. Joe, is it, spell it. H-O-P-E, I get it. Job. No, the J-O-V. E. Job. 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 Yes. Okay, the book of Job. Right. I follow you now. Fine. You're well in, you see, the book of Job is a very, very, uh, uh, difficult book, actually. It's a true historical book. That's something that did happen. But yet it is written as a historical parable. And Job, actually, when we work through it carefully, find that Job is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, because remember in the book of Job, he started out, he had everything. He was, he was a righteous man, absolutely blameless. And then everything was taken away from him. And, and uh, he was, uh, he lost everything. And then at the end of the book, it ends up that God gives him back everything more so even than he had at the beginning. And that's like Christ, who emptied himself of his glory and became a, 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 a sin for us. And then God restored everything to him. He became, uh, he continued as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, in chapter 2, we find here some surprising information. Uh, the big surprise is that Satan is allowed to be in heaven. And, and only later on, when we get into the New Testament, we find that at the time of the cross, Satan was defeated by Christ and cast out of heaven and has never been able to return there. But until that time, he had access into heaven. That surprises us no end. Just as it surprises us that after he caused mankind to sin, God gave him rule over mankind back in Genesis. And so we, we, as we read the Bible, there are surprises. And yet, because we know the Bible is the law of God, it is the word of God, therefore we know it's true. Now here it's, it's indicating where God is setting up this, this testing program for Job, He's telling, uh, you, know, you know, Satan is telling uh, God, well, you, of course you love Job because he, uh, you have given him everything, you've cared for him, you've, uh, you've watched over him, but take it all away from him and watch him curse you. Watch him turn against you. And God says, okay, go ahead, take it all away from him. And he allowed Satan to take everything away from Job, and yet Job uh, remain faithful uh, uh, all the way to the end. But that's just a, uh, a beginning uh, piece of information. Like I say, uh, uh, in order to really understand the book of Job, we'd have to start with first chapter, verse 1, and patiently go through the book, which would be a very long study. And, uh, and then slowly on, I, it would begin to open up as a beautiful flower because that's the nature of the Bible when we really get into it. In it. But, uh, but it would be a very difficult study, and I can only, I can only kind of uh, uh, give a general outline of what it is that it is a historical parable uh, with Christ as the focus. That's the best I can do right now. But now we've come to the end of our time again uh, how wonderful it is that again and again we can talk so openly and confidently about salvation and, and, and ready to look at any kind of a question concerning salvation because uh, the Bible is really teaching us more and more truth. But now we've come to the end of our time until our next open forum. May the Lord richly bless you. Good night. <laughs> 